Chapter 9. The Intuitive Perception of Truth. Books that thrill the reader with pleasurable emotions. Theories to account for it. Literary style. Personal magnetism. The soul's love of truth. Books popular in proportion to their truth. The scriptures. The philosophy of Jesus. Intuitional perception of its truth. Evolution of religion. Christianity the final goal. The impossibility of improving upon true Christianity. The absolute religion. T.T. has often been remarked by intelligent readers of books that some authors have a faculty of impressing their personality upon their literary productions so that one experiences, when reading them, a thrill of pleasure and satisfaction akin to that felt when listening to an orator who possesses what is known as great personal magnetism. Some have attributed this feeling wholly to the literary style of the author, whilst others, more prone to suspect that an occult force is concealed behind every phenomenon have held that the personal magnetism of every author is, in some inexplicable way, impressed upon the pages of his book. It seems obvious that neither of these explanations can possibly be the true one. The first cannot be true, for the reason that it often happens that works which create the deepest impression upon mankind are written in a very unattractive style, whilst other works leave no lasting impression upon the minds of their readers, although couched in terms of faultless elegance. The second explanation is defective, even to absurdity, for whatever occult force, personal magnetism, or psychometric or telepathic impression might be supposed to accompany an author's personal manuscript. It is obvious that it could not be transmitted to the printed page which the author never saw or handled. Besides, it often happens that editions of an author's works are printed hundreds of years after he is dead, but it has never been noted that the element of so-called personal magnetism diminishes in force or intensity as the additions of his works are multiplied. The thrill of satisfaction which every man of intelligence feels when reading the lines of Shakespeare is not diminished in intensity as the years go by, nor does it suffer any appreciable change since it has been claimed that they were written by the greatest, wisest, meanest of mankind. It is evident, therefore, that we must seek elsewhere than an elegance of diction or personal magnetism for an explanation of the secret of the permanent popularity of a book. Broadly speaking, a book is permanently popular in proportion to the amount of truth it contains. Works of fiction constitute no exception to this rule, for our appreciation of a novel is in exact proportion to the fidelity to nature with which its characters are portrayed. What is true of a work of fiction is necessarily true of a work professing to deal with facts, as in history, or with principles, as in science, in philosophy, or in religion. The love of truth is inherent in the normal human soul, and its recognition of truth is instinctive. This in itself constitutes a psychic phenomenon of the utmost importance, and it is one which must enter as a factor into every correct diagnosis of the attributes of the psychic entity. It is this instinctive perception or recognition of truth when it is presented that gives rise to that emotional thrill of pleasure and satisfaction which one experiences when reading the statement of a vital truth. It is the soul's response to a suggestion which is in accord with its own deductions from the facts of its own experience. In this connection, it must be remembered that the memory of the subjective mind is perfect and that its power of deductive reasoning is also perfect. It is, however, devoid of the power of induction proper, being constantly amenable to control by suggestion. When, therefore, a suggestion is imparted to it I that corresponds to its own deductions, it instantly recognizes its truth and responds with a thrill of pleasurable emotion. This emotion alone is indubitable evidence that it is a purely subjective experience, since the subjective mind or soul is the seat of the emotions as well as the storehouse of memory. This phenomenon is experienced in a greater or less degree upon the perusal of any book which contains what the reader recognizes as truth. And the intensity of the emotion experienced is in proportion to his estimate of the degree of importance to be attached to it as affecting himself. For the purpose of this inquiry, however, books must be divided into two general classes. Those which treat of temporal affairs belong to one class, and those which deal with questions pertaining to the attributes, powers, and destiny of the soul belong to the other. Those belonging to the first class never produce the phenomenon proper of which we speak. Such books may be never so interesting or important to the temporal well-being of man, yet they rarely, if ever, produce other than a purely intellectual enjoyment. On the other hand, 
that which pertains to the soul is taken cognizance of by the soul, which is moved to emotion, pleasurable or otherwise, just in proportion to its recognition of the vital truths which a book contains. By this it is not infinite to convey the implication that the emotions experienced on reading a book are infallible standards of truth. On the contrary, our subjective perception of truth is oftentimes neutralized by our objective perceptions or prejudices, or from those primordial anterior suggestions arising from fixed habits of thought or moral principles. But truth possesses an inherent vitality which no amount of error can wholly extinguish. In the long run truth must prevail, in spite of passion and prejudice. Hence it is that books which contain vital truths, however modest their pretensions or homely their style, will be enshrined and live forever in the hearts of their readers, whilst the more pretentious volume, devoid of the vitalizing element of truth, though adorned with all the perfections which learning and eloquence may impart, makes no permanent impression upon the souls of men, and is soon forgotten by the intellectual world. The faculty of perceiving those truths which affect the human soul is inherent in the soul, although it is in rare cases only that it is largely developed in any one individual. Jesus was probably the only man who was endowed with this faculty in perfection, that is, he was the only one, of whose life we have any record, who possessed the power of independent perception of the laws of the soul. Others possess that power only in the limited sense that they are able to grasp and comprehend the truth when it is presented to them. But in that sense it is so generally diffused among mankind that in the aggregate it must be counted as a most important factor in the social, moral, and religious world. And in an enlightened community it prevents any radical misconception of the fundamental principles of morality and religion. The intelligent reader will have anticipated me in what I am to say regarding the practical application of these observations to the fundamental principles of the Christian religion. It seems to me, that is to say, that the fact that Christianity still exists as a system of religion is evidence, little short of demonstrative, that it is founded upon the true science of the human soul. It is certainly the strongest possible corroborative evidence of the truth of the claim that Jesus correctly expounded the laws of the soul and its relations to the divine intelligence. There can be no other rational explanation of the pregnant fact that the Christian religion has survived the assaults of its enemies for nearly 1900 years and is still the religion of the most enlightened nations of the earth. It has not only survived the assaults of its enemies, but it flourishes in spite of the mistakes of its friends. If it had not been founded upon the rock of eternal truth, it might have temporarily imbibed a vitalizing inspiration from the opposition of conflicting religions, but it never could have survived the proselyting methods of Charlemagne, the zeal of the Inquisition, or the dogma of plenary inspiration. It is safe to say that no system of religion has ever flourished amidst so many adverse conditions as has the Christian religion. It had its roots in a region remote from the centers of civilization, and among a nomadic race, who were poor, and despised and reprobated and persecuted by their more powerful neighbors. From the first it encountered the refined philosophy of the most enlightened nations of the earth, and it has been engaged in stubborn conflict with all the material science of modern civilization. It has its literary setting in a volume which teaches an absurd astronomy, an impossible geography, and a cosmogony the crudeness of which is detected and exposed by the learning of every schoolboy. And yet it exists, not in decrepitude and decay, but as a vital element in every civilization worthy of the name. Its votaries have thrust it into conflict with every science, and I it has been defeated in every encounter. Yet it is not relegated to the domain of ignorance, but flourishes in the greatest luxuriance of growth and vitality in those nations whose people are the most enlightened and progressive. That there is to be found, within the realm of natural causes, some good and sufficient reason for this apparent paradox is not to be doubted. The explanation afforded by the doctrine of a continuous miracle must be regarded as scientifically untenable. It seems to me that the following propositions afford at least a partial solution of the problem. 1. Jesus Christ was endowed with the faculty of intuitional perception of the natural laws of the human soul, and he proclaimed to mankind. In a few simple propositions, the essential principles which govern the relationship of man to his fellow man and to God. 2. All men are endowed with the same intuitional powers, differing only in degree, and by this means they are enabled to recognize, when once presented, any truth which is essential to the welfare of the human soul. 3. It follows that, when one reads the simple but all-comprehensive philosophy of Jesus, 
His soul intuitively and instantaneously recognizes its essential truth. This is what has been, by the Church, vaguely denominated as spiritual perception of religious truth, a phrase which describes the emotion correctly enough, but which has never itself been scientifically or philosophically explained. When the emotion of religious worship, which is an inherent attribute of every normally developed human soul, is taken into consideration, it will be readily understood why it is that the Bible affords consolation to such a vast multitude of the human race. It is not alone the words of Jesus which proclaim religious truth, but scattered all through both the New Testament and the Old may be found passages innumerable upon which is stamped the sign manual of eternal truth. Variable and diverse as are the emotions and aspirations, the spiritual wants and necessities of aggregate humanity, there may be found in the scriptures something to fit every case, something to pour the balm of consolation into every stricken breast, something to inspire every human heart with hope. In short, in its power of adaptation to all the experiences of human consciousness, the Bible is unequaled by any other production, human or divine. The philosophy of Jesus, however, constitutes the chief cornerstone of the whole superstructure. It is that which imparts vitality to the whole body of religious doctrine contained in the Bible, which but for that philosophy would have long since yielded to the assaults of scientific skepticism. Of but vital truth can never be wholly obliterated, however, thickly it may be overlaid with error. It may be tempo rarely obscured, but the intuitive powers of the soul are safe guides to its recognition wherever found. Hence it is that the Christian religion has never lost its inherent vitality amidst the adverse influences with which it has been surrounded, but constitutes the essential vitalizing force in the civilization of every enlightened nation. I do not undertake to say that these facts constitute conclusive proofs of the truth of the doctrines of Jesus, but, from a logical and scientific standpoint, it cannot be doubted that they constitute presumptive evidence that, in its essential features, his philosophy bears the impress of truth. I certainly know of no other way of accounting for the hold which the Christian religion has upon the mind and heart of civilized humanity than to suppose that it is the aggregate result of the inherent power of man to recognize truth by intuition. It is certainly an adequate explanation, and, in the absence of a better one, we are logically driven to its provisional acceptance. Here, then, we find another psychic phenomenon of the most stupendous proportions and of the most far-reaching significance, for it is participated in by all Christendom, and the subject matter involves the most momentous problems of human life. Indeed, it may be added that the ethical doctrines of Jesus are universally accepted wherever they are known, whether in Christian or in pagan lands. This part of his teachings may be summed up in these words, the universal brotherhood of man, charity for the poor and unfortunate, peace on earth, and love and goodwill to all mankind. No one disputes the soundness of these principles or doubts their universal practicability as a code of ethics for all humanity. Jesus was the first to teach them in their entirety. The golden rule, it is true, was formulated many years before the birth of Christ, but the idea of mankind as constituting one universal brotherhood, the children of one God, was his, and so was the doctrine of charity, peace, love, and goodwill. It was these doctrines that first broke down the barrier between the Jews and the Gentiles and between the black and the white, and that has since struck off the shackles from untold millions of slaves, mitigated the cruelties of war, promoted the arts and sciences, justice and benevolence, freedom and good government, and established as the chief cornerstone of our civilization the idea of the sanctity of human life and the inalienability of human liberty? What I have said of the ethical doctrines of Jesus applies with almost equal force to his whole system of religion. His fundamental idea of the fatherhood of God and his doctrine of the immortality of the soul, when added to the ethical principles before mentioned, may be said to constitute the essential features of his whole system of ethics, morals, and religion. And it will not be denied that, as a whole, they appeal strongly to the unperverted intuitions of all mankind. Indeed, there is practically but one of his doctrines that has ever been seriously disputed, namely, that of the immortality of the soul. No one disputes the existence of a higher power to which all things are subject. The differences of opinion concerning that power are merely different conceptions of its attributes. Pantheism is but a variety of theism, and atheism really exists only in name. 
Science has disputed the doctrine of a mortal life largely because it has been asked to accept it on faith alone, that is to say, because the proofs offered have been inadequate from the standpoint of material science. It is, nevertheless, true that the human soul instinctively recognizes the truth of every essential doctrine that Jesus promulgated. I have spoken in previous chapters of the evolution of the spiritual man. It would have been equally appropriate to designate the various epics I have mentioned as steps in the evolution of religion, for they are but different aspects of the same subject matter. Considered as steps in the evolution of spiritual humanity, the process still goes on, and must go on until perfection is reached, until all humanity reaches the altitude of spiritual development attained by Jesus himself. Indeed, the evolution of the spiritual man is, in one sense, but a step in the great process of organic evolution. It is the final step in that process of development which began in protoplasm and culminated in man. I say culminated in man, for the same process of reasoning, the same series of phenomena, which demonstrates the scientific truth of the doctrine of organic evolution, proclaims man as the highest creature that can ever have an existence on this earth. As the goal I towards which nature tended from the beginning, having attained that altitude, the process of zoological change came I to an end, and henceforth the dominant aspect of evolution is, and must henceforth be, in the direction of intellectual and spiritual progress and development. Considered as steps in the evolution of religion, the same series of phenomena which we have been considering culminated in the religion which Jesus taught. And that was the end of what may be termed the organic evolution of religion. It reached its highest possible altitude in the simple but grand and all-comprehensive code embraced in Christianity. By the term Christianity, I do not mean that vast mass of theological doctrine evolved by Augustine, Athanasius, Clement, Justin Martyr, and Tertullian. Nor do I refer in the remotest degree to that mass of dogma so ingeniously aggregated by the lesser lights of later years, which has usurped the title of Christianity. I mean the pure and simple code of morals, ethics, and religion the real and essential Christianity which fell from the lips of the man of Nazareth. I repeat, that was the end of the evolution of religion on this earth, for in that code perfection was attained. No one has ever succeeded in improving upon it. No one has ever been able to conceive a higher standard. We hear much of the religion of humanity from those who would free themselves from the restraints of the creeds and dogmas of the church, but the religion of humanity owes its principles to Jesus and to him alone. And the highest ideals of altruism find their realization in the same perfect character. Says Renan, Jesus founded the absolute religion, excluding nothing, determining nothing, save its essence. The foundation of the true religion is indeed his work. After him there is nothing more but to develop and fructify. The only attempt that has ever been made to find a vulnerable point in the doctrines of Jesus has been in the form of a declaration that the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount are too good for this world. It may be true that some of his precepts are impracticable in the present state of civilization. It may be that the meek shall not inherit the earth for many long years to come. V. But the process of the evolution of humanity towards a higher civilization has not yet ceased, and we may rest assured that the time is approaching when there will be universal peace on earth and goodwill to all mankind. The religion of Jesus is for all time to come. It is the religion of the poor and the lowly, and it is adapted to the highest civilization conceivable by man. It is the final religion of humanity, and though the earth and the fullness of time may pass away, his words shall not pass away. This is why I have remarked that the evolution of religion ceased when Jesus promulgated his doctrines. It had attained perfection, and that is all that evolution can do. It is true that his teachings have been misunderstood and perverted, and for many long years the evolution of religion has progressed backward. A vast system of theology has been erected, ostensibly upon the foundation which he laid, a theology much of which bears no resemblance to true Christianity. But this was because man was, as he still is, imperfect. As civilization progresses, however, man will be released from the thraldom of creed and dogma, and revert to the pure and simple code of the man of Nazareth. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. After him there is nothing more but to develop and fructify. As in the organic world the highest possible type is man, so in the religious world the highest possible type is Christianity, and all future evolution of man or of religion must be in the direction of a higher civilization, a more perfect manhood, with all that the name implies.